joy, I would say. Yeah, um, I can imagine. Totally. Yeah. yeah, it's quite dramatic. I, I think it's a, so. May, maybe that will come back uh, during our discussion a little bit. Mm-hmm. The consequences of of COVID. So maybe we. I think we can start now. And so yeah. Yeah. let me um, let me wish you a very good evening and welcome to this um, to this um, discussion. And I see that some people are joining up. I hope there will be more. And otherwise, I hope that um, this will all be live streamed and will be available for future generations to uh, <laughs> take note of. Um, we have a wonderful um, panel today consisting of Mohamed Baradei from Egypt, former Prime Vice President, Nobel Peace Prize laureate. We have Helen Clark from New Zealand, former Prime Minister and former UNDP Administrator. We have Mr. Danilo Turk, he is the former President of Slovenia. Uh, Mr. Wood Albert, who is the former Prime Minister of Israel. And of course, Mr. Arthur Mutambara from Zimbabwe, former Deputy Prime Minister. And they're all still active as ever before and politically active, but also socially active. People with decades of experience behind them in a very broad range of issues. And so we are going to discuss a little bit today on the world in 2030. Could I, could I ask uh, you to uh, mute uh, yourselves when you speaking? Because otherwise we get those echoes. Yeah. But it would be good. Um, and so we will... I'm trying to mute myself. Let's see where. Uh, I'll talk in a second. Uh, no. Am I muted now? Do you hear me? Do you hear me? Uh, yeah. yeah. Bo- you bottom hear me? left. Bottom, bottom left. left. Yeah. You see uh, the camera. You see the camera on the left. It's the fourth yeah. item from the left. You see the camera. Well, it's not not a, a, a horrible thing, but maybe you can yeah, have a look in the mirror. Ah, perfect. Perfect. Yeah. Everybody muted. Yeah, because you now you are muted. I didn't mute myself. You are back. Am I back? Okay. Okay. Perfect. Well, I didn't even mute myself, but a little. Um, so the world of 2030. Well, the world of 2030 starts basically today, you could say. And today we see that the world is in disarray. Uh, we, ha- we are not just dealing with a pandemic, but also we are dealing with um, a, a celebration of UN 75. That's not just a source of joy, but also a source of concern. Um we have we we celebrate basically five years of SDGs, but the celebration has a bitter edge because it's not um, the SDGs are not heading uh, into the right direction. The Secretary General of the UN has repeatedly warned of the fact that uh, some of the SDG, basically all the SDGs, are lagging behind, but some are even in reverse. Poverty is on the increase. Uh, hunger is on the increase, and we see also the amount of refugees in the world soaring. It's now nearly 80 million people on the run inside of countries, but also a transborder. Um, and so there are many, many different challenges to overcome. Um, and uh, a huge one is, of course, the climate challenge, climate change. And we see that all the agendas are lagging behind in implementation. So promises have been made, reconfirmed. Um, but what happens in practice? And I would really like to hear from all of you. <clears throat> where do you feel we are going? What and how can we go there? What are the obstacles to get there? Um, to get the secure and peaceful world we are looking for, just and inclusive, sustainable, prosperous and based on equality. Um, the world in which no one is being left behind. That was the promise of all world leaders, and that promise has been reconfirmed um, last uh, week by all world leaders 
in the declaration on the commemoration of uh, UN 75. And so we have a vision, we have a strategy, we know what needs to happen, but how is it going to happen and how, where do you see the obstacles and opportunities? So I, I would uh, really love to uh, start by giving the floor, but he's just disappeared again. <laughs> So I'll, I'll start um, by with Helen Clark um, because she's our f only female panelist. And of course, um, the females here are first. So please, Helen, go ahead and make us happy well, with your insights. Well, it's not such a happy time globally, is it? No. But we, we have to keep hope alive because... Uh, Without that, the people perish, as the old saying goes. So, Simone, you, you asked us all to uh, perhaps take in mind a, a, a couple of introductory questions when we commented uh, yep. what's our perspective as to why the SDGs are off uh, track and, and, and what are the you know, three to five things that could be most important to do about it. So, so let me make the obvious point that the sustainable development goals were off track before COVID-19 struck and they're even more off track now. But if we go back to just before uh, the pandemic struck, the reality is that the SDGs in, in the socioeconomic area on the indicators of extreme poverty and hunger and education for every child of, of a certain quality uh, and the health uh, goals, uh, they were all about, in a way, reaching the last mile and the last mile is hard to reach. And you need to put a tremendous amount of investment into reaching the last mile. And we've never seen uh, the stepped up level of investment necessary uh, that would able, enable that to uh, happen. Uh, you also find that on the last mile, you often have, a, if you like, a nexus of issues, a, a cluster of issues, which make it hard to reach eradication of poverty and hunger and get every child in school and, and everyone accessing uh, health services. And that nexus uh, is obviously uh, has as factors, high levels of inequality and poverty existing. Uh, the governance often uh, quite uh, ineffective, either because it has no, no reach beyond the boundary of a, a capital city or, or even a presidential palace, uh, often the lack of, of, of rule of law, high levels of corruption, uh, so the, the most uh, richly endowed countries can also be the, the poorest uh, G, GDP per capita because the, the, the mineral of, for endowment, for example, doesn't, doesn't reach the population. Mm -hmm. Along with this can often go uh, elements of, of outright uh, conflict. And some uh, countries in this nexus of issues uh, also are very disaster prone, uh, for, for example, uh, to drought, uh, which can uh, dash livelihoods as, as well. So... You know, as, as I run through those issues, people will have a, a number of countries in their mind where, where it's very, very tough uh, to, to, to make headway and needs a tremendous uh, amount of support. Now, uh, secondly, I think it's worth making the point that the Sustainable Development Goals themselves uh, emerged in a quite remarkable year where it was also possible to conclude the Paris Climate Agreement and the Addis Ababa Action Agenda on Financing for Development. Then geopolitics changed uh, rather sharply, and we couldn't reach those agreements today. But the fact that we couldn't reach them today also tells us why perhaps there's not the, the follow through uh, on the goals. And I make the third point that the Sustainable Development 2030 agenda was always a rather complex one. And you had almost uh, SDG fundamentalists who had a mantra that went along the lines of you, you, these goals are indivisible and you can't achieve any of them without achieving all of them. And this makes it a very hard hill to climb uh, for, for countries uh, which don't have a lot of capacity and certainly don't uh, have the cash. And the reality is governments have to uh, prioritise. Now, of course, since the pandemic struck, <laughs> we have all, the, all that I've said with, with bells on because for the first time this century, poverty uh, extreme poverty is actually growing again, and there's a lot of estimates as to how many more tens of millions uh, will be affected by that. Some estimates say hundreds of millions. Uh, the numbers of those living in extreme poverty uh, uh, 
in extreme hunger on the brink of starvation are virtually doubling according to WFP forecasts. And you know, there's maybe 30 million children who will never get back to school uh, after the lockdowns uh, closed down school systems. On the health stats, I look at it particularly from the point of view of the Partnership for Maternal, Newborn and Child Health, which mm -hmm. I chair. And, and we are very aware of you know, the numbers of children who are missing out on their vaccinations, the women who can't get their sexual and reproductive health uh, needs met, uh, the likely consequences uh, of unwanted uh, pregnancies, of unsafe childbirth, of unvaccinated children dying from basic disease and so on. So it's not good. Let's come to one of the most urgent actions now to try, try to at least arrest this. Uh, one of them, of course, is to get in behind uh, what's called the Access, Access to COVID-19 Tools Accelerator, which the WHO launched at the big European Union donor conference in May. And they're asking for $35 billion for the development of therapeutics, diagnostics and vaccines. Of course, there's a very strong equity focus because in a COVID world, there's no safety for any of us until we're all safe. And we have to be sure that we get a people's vaccine rolled out and that people in the lower middle income countries are, are not left left behind. Mm -hmm. uh, the second uh, key action, I think, is that the G20 has to dig deep uh, for the cash to support the IMF and the regional development banks and the World Bank to do what they need to do for the country seeking emergency uh, fiscal support and space. And there's quite a lot of them. Uh, over 103 in May already, and uh, these are countries which need debt waivers, they need suspension of pay debt payments, uh, they need fiscal space, uh, they need bailouts, uh, and of course, you know, you, you have to watch the money because when large sums of money are going in, into this, uh, you run the risk of, of corruption again, but it, to stop a, a range of countries going over the, the, the brink, uh, we, we really need a very, very big package uh, through the international financial institutions. My last point would be uh, that uh, aid uh, money, international development assistance money, has you know, pretty much plateaued in, in recent years rather than increasing. It slight increase last year to about $152 billion, but it, you know, in the overall scheme of things, it's not much. And it needs to be focused. It needs to be focused on the least developed countries, the low income countries, the fragile countries. You know, the OECD tells us 1.8 billion of our fellow world citizens live in states that are fragile. There's about 48 countries involved. And I think development assistance that's very focused on uh, what capacities they need uh, to help them to improve governance. Uh, get the health, uh, universal health coverage rolled out, education for all, social protection, uh, adaptation, uh, support through the Green Climate Fund. You know, this becomes very, very important. If we neglect the 1.8 billion uh, people in the 48 countries, we're, we're never going to see the SDGs uh, uh, achieved. And so that, that's very much where I think the priority should, should be going. So that's, uh, for my money, uh, how the issues look at the moment. Okay, well, well, thanks so much. It's, um, it's a hell of a lot of a job. You can already hear it uh, while you uh, present this. I, I, was, um, I would like to, uh, to ask you later on um, about financing for development. Uh, you mentioned a few issues like uh, the, 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 the nexus of um, a lack of rule of law corruption, a conflict, disaster-prone countries, but also, say, man-made disaster, uh, um, the lack of governance, um, uh, all these issues. And then we have this calculation, which was, uh, which was made for finance for development uh, in Ethiopia during that conference. 90, billion, uh, 90 trillion would be needed. Nine, 15 of those would come from development assistance. And so there would, would be a gap of 75 trillion US dollars left, which should be funded through tax increases, taxation, and uh, by institutional investors. And if you listen to what you just said, corruption, lack of rule of law, etc., 
and LDCs, least developed countries, then you have, then I wonder, and I would like to hear your perspective on that, how to fill the gap. How can you convince institutional investors to invest in countries where there is no safety and security for their investments? So very high risk. So maybe that's something to discuss a little bit uh, later on, but that's an important issue because the funding, as you said, needs to be there. So, um, I would like to, um, to give the floor now to Mr. Turk. Um, and basically with the same questions, of course. Maybe, yeah, unmute yourself. Yes, thank you. Right. Well, look, um, Simone, I agree with you that um, what happens now decides on what will be the situation in 2030. Now, 2030 is not that far away, and uh, the developments now will be decisive for what happens. Now, those developments are clearly not good, and uh, Helen Clark has just explained some of that. I was among those people in 2015 who were extremely pleasantly surprised by the ability of the international community to agree on uh, on sustainable development goal. That looked to me like a small miracle or a big miracle. Uh, but of course, it was never clear whether that would uh, hold. And now it has actually uh, disintegrated practically. I mean, the, mm -hmm. the, you know, the implementation was not on track in 2019, and it's even more off track now. And then, of course, uh, also I agree with the uh, notion that actually the deterioration in global geopolitics was a very major factor in all this. Now, the deterioration has been seen since 2010, more or less continuously, and has further when it has further gone wrong uh, in the last three to four years precipitously. So we are in a very dangerous situation really now, and the question is how to get out of that situation. Actually, we live in an era of a very special paradox. Never in human history were the needed objectives for survival of the mankind as clear as they are today. But also never in recent history have we seen such a stark absence of global cooperation among major powers. Now, their representatives don't even talk today. Uh, there is there is no fund, there's no basic communication. That's very dangerous. That 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 no that shows that the world is going really in a very wrong and very dangerous direction. Now, if one uh, compares this factual situation with the lofty words of the UN Declaration on the 75th anniversary, you can see a very nice and systematically organized set of desiderata. Of course, there are views about past achievements, which are real and, and significant, and there are expectations for the future, which are basically a list of desiderata. There is no, um, no um, visible uh, factor that would, that, that would give us hope that things would really move in that direction. Now, some of those problems were already uh, mentioned in, uh, by you and by Helen, and I don't want to repeat them. But I think that these are all symptoms of a very deep malaise, which has also its political side, and the global geopolitics is going completely wrong. Now, uh, the question is, where does one see possibilities for change? I don't want to be totally pessimistic at this point. But I think that, in fact... I mean, what's happening in the European Union is promising. I don't know if this is going to be a sufficient uh, factor to, to, to contribute to a major change or not, but it's promising at least European Union in its recovery plan and its uh, seven-year financial perspectives gives hope to the countries of European Union, but also to the world. I mean, the European Green Deal orientation is really significant for the world as a whole, and I hope that that would go further. I think that there are three uh, different approaches that have to be understood uh, in the search for an improvement. You see, in some places, uh, a movement towards 
uh, an alternative for the future will have to be top down. In European Union, actually, that was the case. Actually, it was, you know, the Green, European Green Deal came from the European institutions. Of course, it is supported by a very strong movement from below, but it is top down. And uh, I think it needs help. Uh, in the United States, uh, whatever positive happens will have to be bottom up. Uh, we see cities um, uh, doing important things in the in the area of uh, um, you know climate um, related policies. Uh, we see pressures building from from bottom up, and I think in the United States, any change has to come bottom up. Uh, China, on the other hand, is top down. Now, I would uh, take as a bit of uh, uh, useful information what we heard from Xi Jinping, the president of China, a few days ago when he spoke about making China a carbon neutral by 2060. Now, I, again, I don't believe words just because they are words. No, mm -hmm. not the case. But I think that one has to understand the nature of these different approaches in the key areas of the world. Uh, and and build a um, future around that. If there is success, and of course much will depend on the outcome of American elections in a, in a month from now, um, uh, then obviously there is some hope. But otherwise, I, 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 I'm afraid that the world is moving into a very dangerous direction and we may see many disasters in the year to come, in the years to come. So that's what I can say answering your question. Okay. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I, I think that that this calls for um, maybe some some more discussion on issues like you you mentioned the role basically of the permanent members also of the UN Security Council, who are totally basically one could say non constructive at this moment. If you look at the yeah. proxy wars going on in countries where they fight one another um, and uh, are not willing and able to, uh, to see to it that there's peace being achieved, also leading to many other problems like the enormous surge of refugees. And of course, well, Helen is of course... Um, of East Congo and these, these issues. So we have a lot of desiderata, as you said, but realization is an issue. And I would really like to hear from you, is the sense of urgency among leaders big enough? Uh, I have been listening in this today and I'm listening to lots of discussions. And there, are, as you say, lots of words by leaders who have the power and have been elected into power to make the change but apparently don't do it. So I would like to hear your perspective on the leadership, leadership aspects of getting where we need to go and how to promote um, better, more effective, more responsive, more accountable leadership. Maybe that's for the discussion. Let's go now quickly uh, to um, Mr. Mutambara. Would you be willing to take the floor now and then we go on? Can yes. you hear me now? Yes, we hear you. I, okay, I hear yeah. you. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I think everything will rise or fall on leadership. We have uh, global challenges. We have global problems. What's missing is global leadership. We don't have global leadership. We have national leadership. The national agenda is what is driving most leaders in the United States, in China, in Russia, in Africa. The nation state is the unit of analysis. And we're trying to use the nation state to address global challenges. It will not work because the mandate of national leaders is to address national interests. And as a result, they pay lip service. They talk about global challenges. They talk about global cooperation, but they don't act on it because their mandates are national. That's why there's no leadership from the United States. As you look at them going to an election, they're discussing national issues because 
their mandate is national. So I want us to be able to understand the reason why there is more talk than action, the reason why there is more heat than light in terms of SDGs, in terms of global challenges, nuclear weapons, HIV AIDS, um, in terms of COVID, there is talk, but there is no commitment of resources because resources are nationally driven. So we must, as leaders, understand that in the absence of global leadership, most of us are going to be talking about this and not acting on it because resources equal results and resources are being driven by national agendas and national aspiration. That's one fundamental problem that we must address. Secondly, we must also think about this notion of um, collective humanity, a shared humanity. You see, you cannot have success in the United States when there's poverty in Somalia, where there is discontent in Zimbabwe. We must understand ourselves as part of one humanity, a collective humanity, which means we must think in terms of how can we all do together. That's why this virus is very interesting because this virus is global. This virus shows us that we are all vulnerable in America, in Zimbabwe, in Malawi, in Australia, because of the global nature of the virus. What it means is that we must make sure our planning, our resourcing, our thinking is also global. But as I indicated earlier on, the major problem is that most leaders are operating on a national mandate and not a global mandate. There's a dearth of leadership globally. Now coming to what can be done, what should be done, I think there should be more emphasis on um, regional sovereignty as opposed to national sovereignty. There should be more emphasis on global sovereignty as opposed to national sovereignty. For example, where I'm coming from in Africa, our economies are very small. We must be emphasizing regional integration, SADC, COMESA, ECOWAS, the African Union, the African Free Trade Area, why? Because when we come together as blocks, we are able to leverage numbers. In Africa, when we work together as a block, we're talking about 1.3 billion Africans. If we were to operate as a market of 1.3 billion Africans, if we're going to operate as one force of 1.3 billion Africans, we'll be able to negotiate better, we'll be able to leverage better our natural resources. Can you imagine if Africans were to pull up and say, we are five countries, Angola, Zimbabwe, Botswana, uh, South Africa, and we are going to have one block on diamonds. We're going to work on our diamonds together. If you want to talk about diamonds, you talk to us as a block. We will name the price of diamonds in the world if we're a block. Platinum, Zimbabwe, South Africa, working as one block, will be able to determine the price of platinum globally. So we are saying one of the major cogs, one of the major weapons with which we can achieve the SDGs in Africa is by collectivizing and working together as a block, as blocks. SADAC, COMESA, ECOWAS, the African Union, the African continent. Scale is important in terms of driving our economies. One of the major reasons why China now is a big player is because they're one big country, 1.4 billion Chinese working together as a multi-force. So we, coming from the continent of Africa, are going back to good old-fashioned Pan-Africanism, good old-fashioned global economic integration so that somehow our economies can be strong, we're able to provide for our people, we can achieve the SDGs through regional integration, through continental integration. Second driver, technology. Technology potentially is a great equalizer because 
you know, you can actually right now, if you think about access to education, access to information, we can, if we are creative, use technology as a major weapon to achieve the SDGs. But we need to be clever about it. How do we use technology in mining? How do we use technology in agriculture? How do we use technology in education? How do we use technology in health? So that technology becomes a weapon, a driver towards the achievement of the SDGs. Again, building that on the back of regional integration. So regional integration, continental integration, then technology as a driver. So that somehow the African people, the African continent can achieve the SDGs. Driver number three, beneficiation value addition. We as Africans are sick and tired of being sick and tired of being producers of raw materials, selling raw diamonds, selling raw copper, selling raw chrome, raw platinum to Europe, and buying refined products, buying plat uh, uh, catalytic converters, buying cars, buying computers. We are saying, why don't we on the continent become producers of refined products, producers of secondary and tertiary products, sell them to ourselves, sell them to Australia, sell them to Canada, sell them to America, sell them to Europe. So beneficiation, value addition on the continent of Africa is going to be one of the ways we can pull our people out of poverty by producing value-added products, by being people who are moving up the value chain as a strategy to achieve the SDGs. Coming, So that's what should be done at the macro level, macro level. At a micro level, we are saying to companies now, it can't be business as usual. During COVID, after COVID, it has to be a different world. You need to rethink your business model. You need to rethink your organization, your value chain, your talent, your supply chain. New leadership skills are required to survive under COVID. New products are required for us to survive under COVID. So re-engineering the business, re-engineering the company. So we need innovation at a national country level. We need innovation at a company level so that we can be able to survive under COVID and survive beyond COVID. So these are some of the ideas I think we need to think about. But emphasis is that it cannot be business as usual. I've heard people throw around the phrase saying um, the new normal. The, no, that is the wrong phrase. It's called the next normal. Because you don't know what's the new normal. So it's a misnomer to talk about a new normal. We must talk about the next normal because it's dynamic, it's changing, and there's movement. We cannot be certain about what's going to happen in the future. So I think in summary, we are saying we must see creativity and leadership at national level. We must see creativity and leadership at country level. Then we must also see creativity and leadership at a company level, at a corporate level. But acknowledging the major deficit being the lack of global leadership at a political level, but we must work within that framework using technology, integration, and also re-engineering our firms and our organizations. So that's what I have got to say for now. Okay. Well, thank you very much. A lot of food for thought. And, um, well, at a certain moment, you said that basically it's all about global leadership. Well, in, in, in your last remark, you said also national leadership. Isn't it, and I would like to hear your perspectives on this uh, later on, um, doesn't global leadership also start at national level? If you look at the SDGs delivery, I mean, we can all keep on pointing to global leadership, but it starts at home. And that goes for all countries concerned. Uh, there was interesting, I led a discussion last Friday, and um, there was uh, several speakers said that 
local leaders at this moment have a hard time because basically they are the implementers of global, um, globally agreed agendas. So that is about mayors, that is about subnational leaders, but also leaders at national level. They have to implement global agendas because the weakest link defines in the end the, um, the, the strength of the chain. And of course, you need this global, global leadership, but you also need very good leadership at national level. And we see that implementation of the SDGs in many countries lags tremendously behind. And that's because also national and local leadership um, lag behind. So I would like to hear your perspectives on that one later on. First, I would like to give the floor to Mr. al -Badadeh. He was He disappeared at a certain moment, but he reappeared, fortunately. And please, sir, um, give us your view on the world in 2030, the obstacles uh, to get there and the solutions that you see for that. You must unmute yourself a little bit there first. All right. Th thanks, Simona. It's good to be with you. Uh, it's clear the present trajectory is a train wreck. I mean, if we if we look at it, it's uh, the dichotomy between our rhetoric and our action is is so wide. You know, as if we live in a in a make believe world. Frankly, I mean, I I look at all the declaration which we talk about. I mean, it's a, it's excellent declaration, but if you translate them into action, you don't see much. And this is not this is not nothing new. I mean, I I saw that so many times. You know, uh, responsibility to protect, for example, huh? which we adopted with great fanfares like fifteen years ago. Yeah, to pre to protect people against war crimes, you know, uh, genocide, what have you, it's almost disappeared right now. So I ask myself, are we are we really sure that we are going to see any of the seventeen SDGs implemented by twenty thirty? You know, and if not, what is the consequences for everybody? I'm not. I'm not very optimistic. Unfortunately, I I try to, but uh, there is a. To my mind, there is a. The basic issue, Simon, is a question of mindset. You know, all these issues we are dealing with, the seventeen issues, are questions of values, basically, equity, justice, human dignity, but I don't think we the global mindset treat them as treat them as simply as ethical values but not understanding that these are values that are central to our survival i mean these are values that are central to our survival and not just ethical values but we don't understand that i don't think we understand that all the issues we challenges we are facing are without borders that we need to work together and yet look at COVID-19 response. It's a painful reminder that we are we're nowhere to be found when it comes to work together. I, I can see also that the distrust between us, the petty fighting, overcoming our ability to look at the big picture. The big picture to me is either we are going to live together all or we're all, all going to think together. It's not a zero-sum game anywhere. But we don't understand that. We talk about climate change, but you don't, you know, we don't put the money where our mouth is, clearly, you know. And some countries even, as you can see, are even doubting that, mm -hmm. you know, despite the painting on the wall. I mean, we see the, you know, the... the so it's it's a question of... To me, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, sorry, you get still current. 
Did we lose uh, Ms. Elberade? I think so. Can you hear me? Yes. Um, okay. Ms. Elberade, are you still with us? I think he should be still there, but no? Hey, hey my, my screen is saying six seconds left. Left. What is that? Yeah, I think he is he is now um I think he is just no, he is not in the conversation anymore. So what I what we'll do, we'll continue with Mr. Olmert and when Mr. Elbaraday comes back, he can um, of course he can he can continue. Uh Mr. Olmert, would you be willing to take over for the time being? Uh, so you no, <laughs> <laughs> I'm ready. Okay, go ahead, so, please. Uh, Ms. Filippini, uh, uh, I listened carefully to uh, all the speakers in the panel, distinguished people, and I think that uh, we would easily agree that uh, here is Mr. Badawi, so maybe he will continue before I really start, okay? Okay. Uh, are, you, are you with us, um, Mr. Badawi? Can you hear us? Can you, because you, you are still, we see a still... Picture? No. I, I think he could, and then he can he can um, come back again. Yeah. I, I'll tell you. I'll make it shorter because I think that there is not a problem for us here and for many in different panels here or in this particular uh, conference uh, uh, organized so uh, ably by uh, uh, Frank uh, Jorgen Richter, which I think we all share. Uh, admiration for him and his efforts, uh, there will be entirely an ag uh, entire agreement about what is needed and uh, what is missing, uh, what are the major problems that we're talking about, uh, either Africa or uh, racial issues in different parts of the world and uh, poverty and, uh, and uh, so on. Uh, they, they, uh, they, it's very easy to identify the major issues, it's all on the table. We all are aware of it. And uh, the real question is, uh, what can be done? And I think, if I may say, that if I like to go to the bottom line, I think that it's, as, as already uh, was uh, said before, it's a matter of leadership. And why, you know, talk in general terms, the beginning of what may be a dramatic change in, and perhaps an opening or something different is one month ahead of us. Let's face it. You know, uh, I'm not going to, I'm not entering into American politics, all right? And I don't want to pass an opinion. But it's obvious that if uh, President Trump is re-elected, this is one policy. And uh, perhaps one can conclude easily that it will be more of the same more of the same in the attitude uh, towards some of these major fundamental issues that we are talking about. And if uh, Joe Biden is uh, elected president, then there is a likelihood that there will be a change. That in itself is not necessarily sufficient, but it's a different course of action. There is no question about it. So I think that the, the, what we are talking about is first and foremost a matter of leadership, of determination, of inspiration, of the courage to take positions which at some points in life may not necessarily be popular within the, sh the uh, a smaller community where you come from, but it is essential if we look at a, a, a global situation and we are prepared to address ourselves to these issues and do something to change it. Now, only if there will be such policy, I believe, a leadership, inspiration, determination, strength, and, and vision, then there is a chance that there will be a cooperation, first and foremost, amongst the top countries of the world. Let's face it. With America, the European Union... China, Russia, uh, I don't want to insult any other country, 
But, you know, the, the major nations of the world, without cooperation among the top five, six, seven nations of the world, there will be a lot of rhetoric. We will continue to participate in many panels, such as this distinguished one and many others in, by Zoom, hopefully soon, by uh, 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 personal uh, meetings in, in, in some place. And we will say the same things, and we will... Uh, we will uh, cry about the same uh, 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 failures to address ourselves to the issues. So here it starts, and we will know whether there is a chance for a change that can bring some uh, dramatic changes in the global scene is with the American elections coming uh, November 3rd, which is about a month from now, I mean, in in uh, you know in, on regional issues, uh, the uh, European Union hopefully will emerge uh, again into some uh, uh, status of 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 uh, uh, stability and and better cooperation. That somehow the uh, Brexit will not you know destabilize the European Union, which we all hope so. Uh, uh, in the Middle East, you know, there, there some changes which took place lately. The uh, peace agreement that was signed between the uh, United Arab Emirates and the State of Israel is positive, is good. For me, it's not an alternative to the need and the, my personal desire to reach an agreement with the Palestinians, which I think is the key to a major breakthrough in the Middle East, without which there will not be any dramatic change and even some of our best friends and, and supporters and, and that were very helpful in the recent developments, including Egypt and Jordan and uh, the Saudis, will not be able to establish within that region something significant without the solution of the Palestinian issue, which is incumbent first and foremost, I believe, upon my country. But again, there will be some changes in this region or in that region without a show of real, visionary, inspiring leadership coming from the United States, China, Russia, the European Union, there will not be anything that will change the agenda of our next panel that we will be invited to speak about. And we will more or less say the same things, listen to the same uh, 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 expectations and uh, regret the failures to address them in an effective manner. Thank you so much. Um, well, um, I'm, I'm also really interested to hear then the answer to your question, because if you ask for visionary leadership from China, Russia, the EU, the US, and some other countries that have a big role to play in this. One heckling. I started with the United States because I think that, I think most of us, it's easier for us to, first of all, to uh, admit that we share the fundamental values which characterize the United States of America uh, uh, for a, as a potential pusher for these changes. But, of course, it requires the participation of all the others. But since there, there are elections in America in a month's time, yeah. we will see whether we will get more of the same or we will get something that may change the perspectives and the, the objectives of the international community. Yeah. So, so, so far, in my perspective, um, the leadership doesn't look very good in the countries that you just mentioned. And, of course, a change of wind in the U.S. might certainly support uh, uh, positive developments, but still, we see that some of the leaders of the other countries you mentioned are not uh, particularly constructive. And... Um, Are we there? You, yeah. you, 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 uh, we didn't hear you. Oh, now you hear me. I, I don't know what this is. It's, uh, the system. No, so, so those countries are not particularly. Are, with the cyber technology, are some of these leaders interfering in order to block us from saying what we think about them? 
I think so. I think it might be not far from the truth. You are muted. Uh, um, Mr. Albarade, go talk. <laughs> I know. I'll, I'll try before I'm, I'm muted or something. Yeah. Yeah, please. So I, was, I think we, we all agree that we really have, we don't have great confidence in the current leadership, you know, without naming names. And it's not just one one country or another. I mean, the overall, the environment is one of distrust, is one of zero sum game that I would win, you would lose. Uh, inability really to understand the issues we are facing. We're facing two existential issues right now, climate change and weapons of mass destruction. And these cannot wait, you know, for all the petty fighting and we are seeing today. I'm not sure that we'll tomorrow we'll find the enlightened leadership. I mean, the only thing I see of hope, Simone, is what happened with climate change. Root, you know, people, grassroot organization, people are coming to say, we don't like what we see. We need the change. Do you hear me? Uh, yeah. All right. Okay. Now, I I don't think it will come top down i think we need we need to mobilize we need to explain to people that what we are having we're doomed if we continue that way and uh, we need we just need a different different framework with different paradigm globally if you look at the collective security system it's completely broken security council is completely dysfunctional you know, it's it doesn't really. I mean, it's almost a joke right now. Uh, it, had it not been for the fact that it's a, it's real issues where the of war and peace we are dealing with at the national level, we have the onslaught on him again by populism against human rights against democracy. Uh, this is this this is happening. So I'm not sure that just trying to educate le leaders, Simone, and I know you do that. It, we need to push them. We need to tell them that is not the way we want to go. That we are on a the tra trajectory is is train wreck, as I mentioned. We need a different a different mindset. We need to understand that we need to work together. We need to understand that we need to forget about our petty fighting. We need to understand that these values, when we talk about equity or or justice, it is not just nice ethical issues. It's a question of our survival. We cannot continue to have this current uh, collective security system that is broken. We cannot to continue to see populism taking over. These are, we, we are, we are not, I think if we will not reach 2030 any better than what we have today. So in my view, we need to, people like us who are not at least in government, we need to talk to each other, we need to diagnose the issues, we need to provide solutions, but more importantly, I think we need to mobilize people. We need to go grassroots. I, I don't think relying on bureaucrats right now, with all due respect, is going to lead us anywhere. We'll continue to have more beautiful declarations, more you know, feeling good declaration, but on, on the ground, we don't see anything. We see climate change every day is we, coming with its ugly head, we see the American and the Russian fighting like cat and dog, modernizing their nuclear weapons. We don't see anything. Go we see poverty increasing. We see inequality becoming obscene. We need people hungry. In the 21st century, we have, I don't know, right, almost a billion people who, who do not even have enough food to eat. Yeah. This is, this is I, I don't know how to describe it. It's, not, it's beyond the scandalous. It's, it's a shame that we have. So I agree that we, we shouldn't just continue to repeat and, you know, say, you know, let us have another declaration. We need to think in a different mode. We need to think in a different mode. And I don't, personally, I don't see that's coming from the top. It has, we have to find a new leaders. 
we have to get people involved. The same way people got involved in climate change, I think we need to get them involved in weapons of mass destruction, in poverty, in injustice, in in populism. We need to mobilize because and make people understand that if we continue business as usual, we have no future, frankly. Yeah, maybe maybe asking you about this because, um, of course, um, you know, I, I have started this initiative, Leadership for SDGs, because yeah. I believe that many leaders need support, leadership development support to do the right thing if they want to do the right thing. And many are faced with huge challenges and have issues um, solving solving those. And I, I never would think that only top-down developments are useful. Of course, you need bottom-up uh, pressure. But, for example, think of a country, uh, think of the Arab Spring or countries like Sudan, where people uh, rallied peacefully for nine months, um, right. uh, ousted the uh, dictator and got a new interim government. But then, you know, what changes? Where's the systemic change? How can those people be successful? So how do the top-down and bottom-up developments come together? How do you look at that point? And how to get it done fast? Because as you said, we have little time. All of you feel a sense of urgency. You display a sense of urgency. So how to get where we need to go? Helen, would you like to say something about this? So yeah. I, I, I think obviously leadership is an absolutely critical ingredient and Arthur is right, there's uh, very little of it at the, at the global level at, at the moment and uh, at the, the, the national level. Um, there are leaders who really let their, their countries down in, in, in many ways, either because they perpetuate uh, unjust and repressive systems and preside over regimes which are kleptocracy, sadly, in a number of cases. Uh, so a couple of uh, practical uh, suggestions, and because Arthur is here from Zimbabwe, I think this is particularly salient. Mm -hmm. uh, one uh, initiative, global initiative I chair, is the Extractive Industries Transparency Initiative. And there is in Zimbabwe, you know, a, a strong NGO constituency for uh, Zimbabwe joining, because uh, what the the initiative is all about is trying to uh, stop corruption in the extractive sector. Now, you look at Zimbabwe, which is so richly endowed in, in minerals, and yet uh, the, the country, uh, the people don't see the, the, the benefit of that because of the way of what, in which uh, it's exploited and the profits go to, uh, to very, very few. Uh, so, uh, Groups like Zimbabwe Environmental Lawyers Association uh, are continually saying if Zimbabwe really wants to realise human development uh, based on uh, what could be possible uh, from its extractive industries, it, it needs to clean up the governance of the sector. It needs transparency. It, it, it needs uh, uh, accountability. So there are international initiatives like that that can help. And I should say that the initiative has uh, well over 50 uh, countries who implement the good governance standard in the extractive uh, industries. And around half of those countries are in Africa. Uganda just joined. And Angola, very importantly, has just signaled its intention to, to join. And, and we're all aware of you know, the, the past of, uh, of Angola's oil resource not uh, benefiting um, human development as, as it should have. Uh, secondly, Simone, uh, we could talk for a moment about your, your own initiative, Leadership for SDGs, because you identified that uh, you know, we, we do also have leaders and ministers who want to do the right thing and want to prioritise human development and, and, and get, get things right. Uh, but often capacity is, is, is very limited, even though the will is small. So specifically supporting uh, those who, who, who want to be supported, uh, to to be able to lead effectively and, and use the the resources they do have, uh, limited as they may be, to to best effect and and you know in smart and strategic ways is well worthwhile. And leadership for SDGs was focused on that. So you know th those are a cu couple of practical things I think could be of assistance. Okay, thank you. Um, who would like to react to these points? 
I'd like to hear from Arthur because I know yes. just how rich Zimbabwe is and how little people have seen yes. from the resort. Yeah. Yeah, thank you very much for those remarks. Yes, it definitely Zimbabwe is very resource rich, but we are dismally failing to manage our natural resources. So I'll be very keen uh, to uh, link up with you and see how we can maybe, you know, learn something from what you're doing and force Zimbabwe to adopt good governance around our natural resources. We've got diamonds, we've got gold, we've got chrome, we've got copper, but we're starving. Yeah, because of the abuse and the corruption and lack of governance. So we, we need to leverage the work you're doing. And so maybe offline we can, we can discuss that. But I wanted to emphasize one thing that, um, you know, it's bigger than we, we need to think about mindset. Look, I'm sure you watched the debate in the States about two days ago. There was nothing global about that debate. There was nothing about international policy or foreign policy. Very domestic, very localized. So even Joe Biden, when he wins, he'll be better than Trump, but not that good either because he's focused on America and he thinks America is the center of the world. We need a mindset that says, how do we emphasize that these economies, these countries are interconnected? Mm -hmm. Canada won't succeed if Uganda is failing. Australia won't make it if Rwanda is in trouble, the global connectedness of our economies. People don't think that way. They think very national. So, and when we get to become prime minister, to become president, to become leader, we are elected by a national constituency and hence the concern are national. When we go to the UN, when we go to the AU, when we go to the, we talk about global issues, but our finances, our money, is not on those issues because the domestic agenda is the agenda. What we need to emphasize is that the domestic agenda cannot be solved unless we solve the global issues, nuclear weapons, HIV, AIDS, COVID, poverty. And, and that I don't see in our leadership. Uh, uh, well, if the U.S. Um, would really go for a national agenda and the SDGs, then they would be able to contribute big time, to be honest, uh, because they have a lot of issues to solve, which are all on the SDG agenda, including SDG 13 and the climate change agenda. So, And they contribute big time to the uh, worldwide uh, issues as to climate change. So, so in that sense, um, somebody said the large countries have to get together. I think Ms. Albara then you know, bang heads and and um, and move forward together. Uh, and that will make a big difference, of course. China, the US, uh, Russia, and some other countries, they, if they would really, uh, India, if they would really make a difference in their national uh, context, they would make a global difference as well. Uh, but of course, you're totally right that, of course, global governance and helping one another, solidarity needs to be there as well. Uh, Mr. Turk, would you like to react on on those issues of um, of leadership, sense of urgency, the desiderata versus realization, and how to get there? Well, as I said in my first set of remarks, I mean we live in an era of paradox. I mean, never in human history have global needs for survival been so clear as they are today, and never in recent history has the absence of communication among major powers been so evident as it today. So this is a pathological situation which has to stop at some point. Now, how should that come about? I mean, we, in our discussions, very often come to the conclusion that what is needed is political will, you know, like a magic formula, political will. Mm -hmm. How is political will generated? How, how does it happen? Again, as I was saying before, I think there are two different approaches and both of them have to be understood. Um, I mean, bottom up, of course, is critical and we'll have an opportunity <clears throat> to see how that's working in the United States very soon. Uh, because obviously, if the elections <clears throat> turn towards a change, then we may have a glimmer of hope, a modicum of hope, that that would gradually create a sense of, you know, 
global concerns being part of the national interest. Mm -hmm. In America, you have this famous um, um, word by uh, Tip O'Neill uh, many years ago, famously said, all politics is local. All politics is local. And to some extent, this is true. I mean, all politics is local because politicians care about their own political survival on elections and obviously local concerns. But now to understand that those local concerns are served better uh, through um, an enlightened international cooperation, that obviously is difficult to do. And I think that, you know, from looking from bottom up, I see many positive thinking in the United States of America. It just doesn't get politically articulated. Mm -hmm. That's a problem. And if Europe had a good interlocutor in the United States, together they can do really good things because in the European Union we see things are moving in the right direction. They are not there yet, but they are moving. Now, there was a question which I saw on my screen from Helena Linden. Mm -hmm asked what should we do about 50th anniversary of Stockholm conference, which will be in two years' time. How to come to, uh, how to, come to um, um, measurable and actionable conclusions? Well, it's the end of 2020 now. We are still in the COVID crisis. But I think that there are elements that could be brought to 2022 conference uh, uh, quite, quite strongly. I mean, European Union has this 55% decrease of green gas emissions by 2030. All right, we can then start talking about what is the objective for 2022. It's not going to be dramatic, but the direction should be clear and should be should should lead to actual significant results by 2030. I believe that if elections in the United States go the, in a, towards a change, that is a bit of a hope that there could be a meaningful dialogue on that too. I mean, after all, look, the fires in California, how much more evidence do you need that there is something really wrong with the climate? I mean, to say that this is all based because of poor forestry management, this is such a nonsense that I mean, I don't think that serious people are going to believe that for a very long time. So what I'm trying to say is, I mean, it's all fine to diagnose the situation is very bad. And we agree on the diagnosis. Now, the therapy is more difficult to figure out because it's not going to yield result anytime soon. But we are not without hope completely. I mean, you know, things can change and could lead to a better understanding. And, uh, uh, you know, what um, uh, Mr. Tambara said about this, in well, how does one define national interest? Well, national interest could include international cooperation. There is no need to have such excessively narrow definition of national interest. Uh, that can include and should include that. And, of course, there are many thinkers who, who are very clear on that point, and there are many political actors who are very clear on that point. So I think that now the time is really quite critical to move in that direction. And then on top down, you see, of course, places, uh, uh, big countries like Russia and China, they are more top down, especially China. But these uh, leaders also understand, uh, you know, the basic problems of the world. And uh, if this whole tendency of drifting towards zero-sum game, Cold War patterns and all that are stopped, then we, we do have a hope mm -hmm. that a better dialogue can be worked out, let's say, in 21, 22, 23. I mean, it's not going to go overnight, but it's not without hope. And just one last word about the United Nations. You see, when the declaration was negotiated, I talked to the co-chairs of the uh, negotiating committee. And I asked them, are you going to go for consensus or would you allow a vote? And I said, no, 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 it has to be consensus. Now, look, if you want to work in the United Nations on something like this, on consensus, you're going to get what? Desiderata? Mother Very of weak. <laughs> so what is leadership in the United Nations? You know, there has to be a determined group of member yeah. states to say, all right, look, I mean, we understand the 
discrete charm of consensus, and we are sort of often charmed by, by, by consensus. But there are moments where you have to take a vote. I mean, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights was voted. They didn't wait for consensus. And that has led to very significant change over time. So maybe the time has come when the review of the uh, su sustainable development goal is, is going to be put on the agenda to say, all right, I mean, there are things that are so urgent that we can't uh, afford consensus. Not everything, but, but, you know, select the core requirements of our moment. So, and I mean, I, I, I don't want to expand on this too much, but you see, there are spaces for both pressures from bottom up and mm -hmm. for leadership where leadership is due. Yes. I think that this exists. And obviously, we don't. We are not in power right now. We cannot do very much, but we can talk and we can promote this sort of thinking as much as we can. Certainly, yeah. No, and 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 you might not be in power, but you have, of course, still a lot of influence. Groups like like yours, uh, people like you, sure. who have access to to uh, to high level other people and who can uh, who can try to promote positive uh, developments, right? So, Mr. Omer, would you, because I want, I need to close a little bit down because we have been uh, talking for over an hour. I think we could talk forever about, on those issues, but it's a never ending discussion and we want to go from the talk to the walk anyway. Yes, so, <laughs> and we I, still. I will be very short. Sure. I'll be very so, sure. Okay, please go ahead. It's been very, it's been very clear. I, 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 I'm sorry that Mr. Al Badawi somehow uh, disappeared. Regrettably, I think he's a yes. very. Man and his, uh, I will send him an email. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, uh, uh, what I want to say is this. Look, you know, I, I, I entirely agree with all these uh, ideas. I, I'm for a, a vote in the United Nations, not for a consensus. But the ability to reach a consensus is just as good as the ability to reach a, a, a decision by a vote because if there will not be an understanding between America, the EU, the Russia and China, okay, and hopefully maybe India and, and Japan, okay, there is not a chance that a vote will make any difference uh, or that, that uh, you know, we will reach something. So at the end of the day, it is a meta of the kind of determination and leadership that can change the life of the, uh, on a global basis. I want to bring just a couple of examples to show how sometimes, as you, Mr. Turk, say correctly, that the national interest was interpreted in a much broader base to have changed the world. Take uh, the, uh, the Marshall Plan after the Second World War. America invested in the rehabilitation of Europe uh, the value of the dollar today maybe hundreds trillions of dollars in order to rehabilitate Europe because America thought that the rehabilitation of Europe is essential for the stability of the world that America believed in. And so the which was not obvious in American political life because we all know that it was so difficult for Roosevelt to force America into the Second World War uh, until after the elections in 1940, which were quite historical because it was the first time that the president ran for third, uh, for third term. So this is one example. I can bring you another one and conclude by this. You are talking about Africa. I'm familiar with some African countries not with Zimbabwe, but I've been to I've been to Nigeria, I've been to South Africa, I've been to Zambia last year, and so on. There are many things which must be changed in the internal uh, governments uh, in Africa in order to be able to utilize the enormous potential of wealth and richness which exists in those countries and which is not coming to fruition because of corrupt leaders and systems which are entirely inadequate to the needs of the people. Now, America has started in the past, not in this last term, certain uh, strategies in order to 
uh, isolate leaders which were not behaving, you know, according to these standards. But if there will not be cooperation again between America and China, for particularly China, on these issues, and China will continue to invest billions of dollars with governments which are not necessarily involved in the improvement of the quality of life of their own people and improving the, the uh, horizons for the new, uh, citizens, then it will fail. Mm -hmm. So all brings me to what I have started with. It's a matter of leadership. And it's mostly, mostly, at the end of the day, it's top down. And we will see maybe a beginning of a change if in a very important and powerful nation uh, in the next months there will be some changes and I'm not offering any opinion now, not about this candidate, about that candidate, but their, their agendas of Trump and the agenda of Biden are entirely different. What is the agenda of Trump? Maybe it's great for America and the Americans will decide. But in terms of those uh, 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 perspectives that we are talking about, I think it's quite clear. Biden may be different. Let's wait and see. If there will not be a change in America, believe me, next year's conference, we will have an opportunity to uh, compare notes again and to entirely agree with what needs to be done and why it wasn't done. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Ms. Filippini, for a brilliant uh, moderation of this discussion. You know, well, I, I, I think you, 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 you didn't you mention former prime ministers, professors, uh, you know, Nobel laureates and so on. And you held it very tight. Thank you very much. Well, I don't think you needed a lot of, um, of facilitation because you have so much uh, to say on issues. And, uh, well, I, I think it would be interesting. I would also love to get back to you because of this leadership for SDGs um, issue, because I think we can help leaders become more successful, uh, all the well-intentioned ones who are struggling to face the huge challenges uh, to transform their countries into a positive direction. And I would like to uh, to finish by, in the first place, thanking you for being there. I will also send Mr. Albada a separate email to thank him um, for his contribution, and also with something uh, Tarun Anand uh, uh, said this afternoon during one of the other sessions. And I think it was quite a good one. He said that is an, he is, he's from India, and uh, there is a, a question there. Uh, he said, are you a good ancestor? Will we be good ancestors for the ones to come? And I think that is a very good thing to think of because we can all understand what that means. And in basically also all religions and all faiths, you have this concept of being and becoming a good ancestor. So I, I, I hope we, by working together uh, with the energy and the sense of urgency that apparently we all feel, we will be able to make a little difference into the positive direction. I would really like to thank you for your presence, for the struggle also, Mr. Tuk, to come on board. And finally, you got there. Um, and for taking the time for this discussion. Thank you so much. Thank and you all. To, to thank see you all. all of you back in the, uh, honor and pleasure. With the best of circumstances. Thank you very much, Simo. It was thank wonderful. You. Thank all of you. All right. Thanks, Helen. Bye bye. Bye, Mr. Pudabada. Bye, Mr. Albert. Bye, Mr. Tuk. <laughs> bye bye. And thank you, audience. On the left bottom, you can get out of the conversation. Left, most, yeah, left one. On the bottom left, you see leave, the little red thing. Yes.